In this and the next video, I'm going to talk to you about phase values and in particular the phase angle time series and how to work with that phase angle time series. This comes from the result of complex Morley wavelet convolution. In particular, we are interested in the consistency of phase angles and the timing of phase angles over different trials or different stimulus repetitions. This is actually not such a tricky procedure, but it does involve a little bit of diff a different way of thinking compared to how you've been thinking about looking for consistency or measuring consistency over trials. And this will be a nice application of Euler's formula that you'll see towards the end of this video. So let me start by reminding you a little bit of the features that we are extracting from the broadband signal. So we use wavelet convolution or some other methods that I will discuss later, but mostly wavelet convolution to extract the narrowband signal, the amplitude time series, or you know, you'd square this to get the power time series. And for this video, we are interested in the phase angle time series. So that's this like sawtooth looking process that goes up and down and it's telling us about the exact timing. So you can see every time there is a trough in this filtered signal, we have a phase value that goes down here. So this, the phase angle time series is tracking the exact timing of this narrowband signal independent of the amplitude. You can see that the phase angle time series doesn't have uh, and a change in amplitude that varies with the amplitude time series or the power time series. Now, for a narrowband signal, or I guess I should say for a time domain signal, or for an amplitude time series or power time series, if you want to know how consistent the uh, time series is over different trials, different stimulus repetitions, all you do is average them together. Just like when you create an ERP, you're just averaging the time series together over a lot of different trials. So just simple averaging at every time point. Likewise, to see if the amplitude or power time series is consistent over different trials, you are also just averaging. You have to do some feature extraction first. That's why you do the wavelet convolution. But once you've extracted this time series, you are still just doing a simple averaging over different trials. So can't we do the same thing with the phase angle time series? Here we have a bunch of single trials. So these are the phase angle time series from a bunch of different trials. And here I've just averaged them all together and it looks like mostly a flat line. Now, I'm going to say that this is wrong. This is not the correct way. This is not the appropriate way to average phase angles over different trials. And if you don't already know why this is wrong, why it's wrong to it just averaged the phase angles over all these different trials, averaging these together, just like you would average together the ERP or the uh, amplitude time series, then I encourage you to pause the video now and take a moment to think about why this isn't the right thing to do. So the reason why this isn't the right thing to do is because when we are averaging together these numbers, we are averaging them as if they are normal numbers on a linear number line. But these phase angles are not numbers that are that come from a linear number line. In fact, they reflect phase angles here. So you can also think of this as the k in Euler's notation, e to the i k. So these phase angle time series refer to these angles here. And the thing is, angles don't go on a line. Angles go in a circle. And that's why you see that they uh, it looks like they go all the way up and then suddenly cut down. In fact, what's happening is this is just going from you know, 2 pi to 0 or from plus pi to minus pi, depending on exactly how you are counting these. So this vector is spinning around here. The angle goes from 0, it increases to 2 pi, and then it gets back to 0. Allow me to make this even more clear. So let's say we have these two vectors here. These two vectors, the angles of these two vectors are 2 pi, and this cyan vector has an angle of minus 0.1 radian. So it's just going down a little bit. So the question is, what is the average vector? If we would average these two vectors together or average the angles of these two vectors, what do you think that average vector would be? I'm sure you've guessed that it would be somewhere here in between these two vectors, maybe a tiny, tiny bit shorter, but the angle should be here. However, 
If you average these two numbers together as if they were regular numbers, so not angles, just treating these as regular numbers, then the average of 2 pi, and we can just call this 0, the average of 2 pi and 0 is pi. So then if we create a, a vector with an angle defined by the average of these two numbers, then we get a vector that points out here. And I hope you agree that this is clearly wrong. This is definitely the wrong result. This is not the average of the blue and the cyan vector. So instead, what we need to do when averaging or when thinking about looking for consistency or clustering in these phase angles is to average the vectors in the complex plane, not average the angles together. Okay, so I hope that this builds a little bit of intuition. This is the right thing. This is what we want to be working towards. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about averaging vectors together, how that works, what it means, and then I'll show you the formula for computing the consistency or the clustering of phase angle time series. Okay, so here we have two vectors, the, a blue vector and a yellow vector, and the question is, how do we compute the average of these two vectors? So there's a way to do it geometrically, and there's a way to do it algebraically. I'm going to show you the geometric picture first. So what we do is we take one vector, and we slide it, so we don't change the angle, we just translate it, we push it up so that the tail of this vector starts at the head of this vector. So that's going to look something like this. So this is exactly the same vector. It's the same length. It's the same orientation. All I've done is just shifted it up so that it starts at the head of this vector. And then we draw a new vector that goes from the origin of the first vector, so the tail of the first vector, to the head of the second vector. So that looks like this. Now, this is not the average of these two vectors. This is the sum of these two vectors. So this is how, this is the, the result of adding these two vectors together. To get the average, of course, we just have to divide by n, divide by the number of vectors that we are adding together, which of course is 2. So that gives us a result like this. So this cyan vector is now the average of these two vectors. Okay, so that's the geometric picture. Algebraically, it's even simpler. We have two vectors, and you just average all the corresponding elements together. So uh, this is vector 1, 2. This is vector 2, 1. So we average them, uh, we add them together, that gives us 3, 3, and then divide by 2 because we are adding two vectors, and that gives us 3 halves and 3 halves. And the algebra, of course, is consistent with the geometry. So the idea is that if we want to look for the consistency of phase angles, we do not average the phase angles themselves. Instead, we have to average the vectors themselves. And then we can think about the angle of this vector, but it turns out that we don't really care about the angle itself. What we care about is the length of this line. And let me show you why we care about the length of the average vector and not the angle of the average vector. The key concept here is that when the individual angles are close together, when they are clustered together, then the average vector is going to be longer. And when the individual vectors that we are averaging together are more distributed, when their, their angles are more spread out, then the average vector is going to be shorter. So here, for example, you see three pairs of angles in blue and the average between them in orange. And so what we are interested in is the length of this average vector. And you can see the closer these angles are to each other, the longer the line. So this is shorter. And here we have two uh, vectors that are uh, almost 180 degrees apart from each other. And the length of the average is very short. And this should also make sense when thinking about the geometric perspective of averaging vectors that I showed in the previous slide. So again, the concept is that when you have a population of vectors, the length of the average vector tells you about the consistency of the angles of those vectors. And here we're always using unit vectors. Okay, so how do we quantify this? How do we exactly compute the length of this average vector? So here's where Euler's formula comes in handy. So we have this distribution of phase angles. And again, these are the phase angles that come from the output of uh, complex wavelet convolution. And so T here might be a trial 
So we have for any given time point, we have a collection of phase angles, a distribution of phase angles over different trials. And then what we do is we put those phase angles into Euler's formula. So we have e to the i theta. So now we do not have, so the, the result of this step here is not a bunch of phase angles in radians. Instead, it is a collection of unit vectors. Note there's no m out here. So these are all vectors with a length of 1. These are unit vectors, and their angles are defined by theta, by these phase angles. And then we average the vectors together. So again, we're not averaging together the angles. We are averaging together the vectors, where each vector is defined by this angle. So we sum up and then divide by n. This n to the power of minus 1 is the same thing as 1 over n. And that gives us the average vector m. Now, this is a complex number. This is a vector in the complex plane. And what we are interested in is the length of this line. And you already know how to compute that. That is just the magnitude of this number, this complex average. So this is the formula for computing the consistency of a distribution of phase angles. So let me show one more slide just to make this a little bit more clear. So here we have one trial. You see the narrowband filtered signal and the phase angle time series. Here's the phase angle time series from trial 2 and up to trial n. So now what we do to compute inter-trial phase clustering or the consistency of the timing of narrowband activity over different trials is to build a distribution for each time point. So we say at this time point, we have three angles, or well, you know, n angles, but here I'm showing three corresponding to these, uh, the phase angle time series at exactly this time point, the same time point over all these different trials. And then what do we do with these phase angles? Well, we generate a distribution or a collection of complex vectors. These are all unit vectors. So the magnitude is 1, the length is 1, and the angle is defined by these angles that we took here. And then we compute the average vector of these three individual vectors, or n individual vectors. And then what we are interested in is the length, so the magnitude of this average vector. And when this average vector is long, it tells us that there is a lot of consistency in the phase angles. And when this vector is short, it tells us that there is a, you know, closer to a uniform distribution of phase angles. There is no clustering of these phase angles. So I hope that builds some intuition and also some math understanding of how and why to compute the average or the clustering of phase angles. In the next video, I'm going to talk more about how to generate intertrial phase clustering and how to interpret that result.